And so um, let me just start by saying that where we're at with this is we're in a, um, let me move this toolbar so I can get to it. There we go. That we're in the second of a three part series. The first was last Thursday night in which I focused and the conversation focused on the underlying causes of the urban rural divide. Tonight, the second part, we're really focused on the Democrats and the Democratic Party, in which probably the majority of us on this call are in and have been for much or all of our lives. And a few specific uh, things about uh, the Democratic Party and where that fits in. And then last, or excuse me, the last session next week, We'll focus on promising strategies, uh, different ideas that we can take from the local level up to broader national things to overcome the divide. So that will wrap things up. There's still room to invite people to come in. Stair has been sharing the first um, session last from last week, and I'm sure she can do that for the second session as well. So you'll recall that we started last week with a focus on this question of how the heck did we get here to this place of not just polarization and division, but extreme rancor, um, kind of a propensity to dismiss, diss, and dispense with people of different political or cultural views, and uh, an immobilized and dysfunctional politics that results from this. Well, we were, we spoke about six different underlying causes and we went into a fair bit of detail on each one. And I'm just going to do a very quick review here to bring us up to speed and then jump into what we'll focus on tonight. The first and kind of foundational cause is that the economy has failed most Americans, really the bottom 80%. Um, and that this is true across much of the country, most of the country, and most types of places, including many, many cities. But I think it's safe to say that rural communities have been especially extracted from um, and degraded economically. The degree of uh, economic problems in rural communities is, is a little bit more heightened than in cities and it's also just more pervasive. There's not as many exceptions to that rule, unfortunately. You will hear commentators on our side talking about the fact that poll data shows that people who voted for Trump were across the economic spectrum and that's true. Um, and, that, and they deduce from that that um, it really isn't the economy. That's not it. It's racism, it's bigotry, uh, xenophobia, and all of those play in. But as somebody who's lived and worked in rural Appalachia now for the last 40 years, and from everything I've read and all the research I've done, I think it's a huge mistake to assume that uh, the economy is not, in fact, a very important part of how we got here. Um, when people's lives are tough, when they're insecure, when they feel like they're spinning their wheels, when they feel like their children don't have uh, a lot of good prospects, that is exactly the fertile ground for um, a shift in ideas and ideology. So the economy and its tremendous failures, uh, particularly in rural areas, is the foundation. That and a whole bunch of other factors that we talked about in the first session has helped to generate this, this very pervasive anger towards elites that is not only in rural America, but is particularly widespread and commonplace in rural America. Elites, by the definitions that um, people who've studied it, uh, studied and talked to rural people uh, have found, are generally defined by rural folks as liberals, Democrats, city folks, uh, academics, experts. Those are the elites in people's minds. And there's a lot of uh, disbelief, mistrust, and anger towards them, us. The third thing is a general anti-government <coughs> sentiment, but a particular focus that I put on is this belief that regulations don't help people. They don't help everyday folks. 
that they're in fact a, an extension of the government's plan or desire to to intrude into our lives and dominate our lives. And that's a big divide because in off the when you look at the polling data, people from the city, people who've gone through um, uh, four year and, and advanced degrees, the belief that regulations are basically good and there to help people is much, much uh, more common than um, among working folks and people in the country. All of this has helped to contribute to a sense that Arlie Hochschild coined the phrase of people feeling like they're strangers in their own land, that they're alienated from politics, uh, the economy's not serving them, and certainly from mainstream culture, including uh, the representations in the media. Now, these last two foundational causes, the underlying causes, we talked about a little bit last time, but this is what we're gonna get into detail about tonight. The fifth is the shift in the Democratic Party, its orientation, priorities, the language used, and how that shift has played into and, and furthered the divide. And then last, and a kind of outgrowth of that, is for mainstream Democrats, and the majority of the party at least, this myth of the middle, I call it, the, the idea of centrism as the solution to our problems or the way to win elections, and the politics of incrementalism that have come out of that. So number five and six, in terms of the underlying causes, are our focus for tonight. Again, in case you just joined, next week we're gonna be talking about what the heck we can do about this. Hopefully some reasonably useful ideas. So this fifth underlying cause, this shift in the Democratic Party's orientation, we're gonna talk about several dimensions of it. Uh, first, with this movement away from the working class towards uh, more educated elites and cultural creatives, and then we'll come back around and talk about a shift in language. In terms of the, the change in orientation from a working class party uh, to a party of the, the, bear, the uh, better educated, uh, the, the technological superstars, it's something that didn't start with Barack Obama at all. In, in some respects, it started with Jimmy Carter. It certainly accelerated with Bill Clinton. It's not just in our presidential candidates, it's kind of in the culture of the Democratic Party. You know, and, and for me, when we see that change and we see our leaders from top to the middle, um, with great deal of comfort with Mark Zuckerberg or the other uh, Silicon Valley superstars or with Wall Street bankers. It's a long way from FDR's statement that the business and financial monopoly, the, the speculators, the reckless bankers, he said, I welcome their hatred because they did hate him. And they hated him because he took them on and he took them on uh, boldly and without hesitation. We've really changed our approach. That's in everything from just the affectations of democratic leaders and liberals, right down to our view of things like antitrust law and how under democratic administrations, as well as Republican, but under democratic administrations, we have more often than not tried to cut deals with even the most egregious uh, white collar criminals, Wall Street uh, traders and whatnot. That orientation and that shift is also felt by working people generally, but also in rural communities, as we said last time, uh, with this idea that there's a bunch of us that work with our hands, um, use our minds, of course, but put our bodies on the line, whether as firemen or construction workers or farmers, loggers. Uh, and then there's folks with desk jobs and how that, that dichotomy, which needn't be such a big deal because there's always been all kinds of work, but because of the general shift in the Democratic Party and the association of Democrats and liberals with the party of the elites and the tech superstars and the very well-educated, um, there's come a lot of resentment as Catherine Kramer demonstrated in her, in her uh, book um, about political resentment that people see folks who work desk jobs who aren't kind of putting their bodies on the line as part of those elites. There's more to it than just perception though. The fact of the matter is that 
in democratic administrations, and again, I'm not, I'm not exactly comparing Republicans and Democrats because I would be the first one to say that um, Republicans have been far worse than the Democrats on virtually every measurement that I'm going to say. But when we have held power, we have perpetuated and, and sometimes um, exacerbated this perception that we're just part of the elites. And this elite democratic revolving door played out over and over again in the Obama administration. Eric Holder went from being uh, the attorney general uh, right to the giant and elite private law firm Covington and Burling, as did Lanny Brewer. Eric Holder was supposedly prosecuting uh, white collar criminals, but they were being defended by Covington and Burling. Lanny Brewer was part of his team. Um, very, very, very few prosecutions of, of any of the Wall Street bankers that almost sunk the economy or a big farmer or anybody else. And then when they leave and go to work for the people that they were supposedly um, negotiating against, that shows uh, a real affinity for elites. Same thing happened with Marilyn Tavener, who was President Obama's pick for uh, antitrust chief for the Federal Trade Commission, a very, very important role. And during her tenure, she let virtually every merger go through, including several involving big pharma that led to uh, the demise of smaller companies and higher prices. And she went where? From there to being a health insurance lobbyist. And then Debbie Feinstein, um, who um, also functioned in the antitrust division of the Obama administration, ended up with yet another um, private law firm that fought for white collar and corporate clients. So you have this shift. You have people who are supposedly charged in the administration with, with justice, with bringing corporations to justice, with leveling the playing field with the most powerful. And many of them go from their positions in the government right to the very law firms, lobbying firms, and companies uh, that they were supposed to be um, overseeing. Thomas Frank refers to this phenomenon uh, as the Democratic Party now being the party of the professional class, not the working class. Erica Edelson, who I talked about in the first, who wrote the, the book, Beyond Contempt, in an article she wrote entitled, How Liberals Left the White Lurk Working Class Behind, she says this, Bill Clinton's Treasury Secretary, Lawrence Summers, admits that he never visited Rust Belt cities devastated by NAFTA. They were, according to Summers, they weren't heavily on our radar screen, he said, of these white uh, excuse me, working collar Rust Belt cities, noting that the Democratic Party had become a base of the cosmopolitan elite. This cosmopolitan elite, Erica Edelson says, are the highly educated, the affluent, the people who travel the world, who live in very ethnically diverse places, and pretty much avail themselves of global communication and all of the amenities that comes with it. For these folks, according to Edelson, the benefits of globalization um, are many, and the downsides are few. Michael Lind, who's a more of a conservative commentator, uh, in his book entitled The New Class Warfare, he says that it's come down to a battle between the working class and the managerial overclass, which is another way of saying what Thomas Frank says is the professional class. Lind makes a very persuasive argument. I don't agree with a number of things in his book, but he makes a persuasive argument that this managerial overclass, which is again, very educated folks, mostly living in cities, they're the people who make the rules and enforce the rules, and that this group has little time, little understanding, little sympathy for working folks, for farmers, for rural people. This is really important to understand. And oftentimes in our conversations and our debates, we will wonder aloud, why is it that these folks, these rural people, keep voting against their own interests? Why 
do they vote for people who are hurting the very environment that working people live in, or perhaps poisoning the groundwater or the creeks or the lakes? For the urban environmental movement, or for the environmental movement and its leaders, the environment is primarily something we protect, something we keep people away from or manage and limit the impact that people have. But for rural folks, myself included, the environment is fundamentally about land and livelihood. Whether it's getting your firewood for heating, whether it's fishing, we had an interesting experience just last week. Lori and my daughter Maria and I were hiking in a little place in Washington County and it was a nice afternoon. And we noticed a whole bunch of cars had parked in this rather out of the way uh, place in the county and wondered if a lot of other folks were going hiking. Well, we went for a short hike, it was about an hour. We only encountered one other person hiking, it was a, a couple. But what we did see was lots and lots of folks fishing, fishing in the creek and fishing in the lake that was part of this little area. It, reinforcing the sense that for an awful lot of rural people, people grew up rural, the forests, the land, the, fit, the uh, waterways, they're all about livelihood. Now contrast that with what Ben Dreyfus of Mother Jones said. He was writing about um, uh, something to do with COVID-19 and the sheltering and some of the impacts of it. But Dreyfus says, and this I think he's speaking a fairly common sentiment among environmentalists, that we should be taking a solitary walk through the forest, getting to know nature. I mean, really knowing it the type of knowing that takes time and patience and intentionality, the sort of knowing we don't have enough room for in our busy lives, feeling the soil, sensing the dew, breathing the wind, hearing the birds sing, the deers bleat, and the crickets chirp, meditating on the majesty that is creation and the divine peace that comes from eschewing the flesh of other animals and sustaining yourself purely through the harmonious, nonviolent miracle that are fruits and vegetables, and celebrating this bloodless good by eating an impossible burger. Now, think about what he's saying here. First of all, I can tell you, as somebody who's been raising fruits and vegetables organically for the last 25 years on a small farm, it isn't always a harmonious, nonviolent miracle. That's uh, that's a perspective of somebody who is not down in the dirt trying to make it happen. And we can even put aside his, his little endorsement of the impossible burger and his plea for vegetarianism over eating meat to just get to the broader point that what this individual, and this is a really smart guy who's written some good stuff for Mother Jones, his view of really getting to know nature, really getting to know it, is still several steps removed from what most people in the country would experience as nature. He's talking about smelling, feeling, sensing, touching. But for so many of us in rural areas, the environment, nature, and protecting it, protecting the land, means working it. It means finding the way, whether you're raising crops, whether you're pulling timber out of the forest, for construction, whether you're getting firewood, whether you're fishing, whatever you're doing, it's this working relationship, this livelihood relationship. And that fundamentally has changed how many rural people view environmentalism. And it, it helps to explain why many rural people, including people who are out in, the, in nature all the time, simply don't trust environmentalists. So that's a little bit about the shift in the party. And I, and I went beyond the Democratic Party to talk, I think, about the shift in liberal culture more broadly. But now I want to talk about the other shift that's happening in, in the sense of language. Again, going back to Erica Edelson, who I've quoted before, she, she talks about this a lot. She talks about a, an anti-Trump protester um, taunting Trump supporters with shots that you're ev everybody's on welfare, you're, you're all losers. We have uh, the founder of Daily Coast uh, after the 2016 election saying, be happy that the coal miners lost their health insurance, they're getting what they voted for. We have Paul Krugman saying that the people who voted for Trump, many of whom live in rural areas, are chumps and losers. 
And then we have the common experience that I have all the time of people simply perplexed liberal folks saying, why do these people keep voting against their own interests? Which is not intended as a, a denigrating thing or a contemptuous thing, but it shows a certain level of contempt in that we assume that they simply don't have enough information and they're making poorly informed decisions rather than trying to understand whether their, their voting decisions might come from another place. This is a quote from an article by Erica Edelson. It also is repeated in her book, Beyond Contempt. She says, at the moment, social conservatives hold enormous power in the form of Trump, the Senate, the Supreme Court, and many statewide offices. But the long-term trend is toward greater recognition of the rights of LGBTQ people, and they know it. By they, she means conservatives. She means people looking for something else. They feel marginalized and aggrieved, and every time a liberal scorns their backwardness, they become more entrenched in their narrative of lost honor and more anxious for a blowhard like Trump to avenge them. Now, the point that Eric, Erica is making here, and, and it's the point I'm trying to make, is not that we simply tolerate and let uh, homophobic, uh, racist, anti-immigrant or other sorts of statements go unchallenged, that we simply accept that some people view uh, other people as less than them and do nothing about it. That's not the point. But the point is when we scorn folks and when we display that we believe them, that their views are just ignorant and backwards, there's really no other outcome that's likely to happen except further entrenchment and further sense of alienation, which just empowers people like Trump. We've got to get beyond this contemptuous language. The sixth and final point, which I'm going to wrap up with, and then we'll have about a half hour for discussion, is this idea of, some, some people call it the centrist myth, I sometimes call it the, the myth of the middle. Now, all of these other things have gotten us to a point where oftentimes liberals, to some degree progressives, and certainly Democrats, for quite a few years now, have been searching for the magic formula to win elections uh, and also to win the hearts and minds of people that are definitely not with us at this point. And this centrist myth, or this myth of the middle, sort of says that what you have to do is you have to be cautious, you have to be circumspect, don't say anything too direct. Um, you need to thread the needle with finding the right spot between the right and the left, where you can win over this group in the middle. But what Ian Haney Lopez showed in his book, Merge Left, and in a lot of other writings, is that this middle, which he calls persuadables, uh, nearly 60% of the population, they are in the middle in the sense that they're not hard and fast right or left, but they're not moderates. They are not looking for this careful, cautious, incremental kind of proclamation and policy. They oftentimes, he shows, hold views that are both left-leaning and right-leaning, sometimes self-contradictory. And, and what people want is they want somebody, people, party, who are gonna pay attention to their needs, really understand who they are, respect those needs and propose bold solutions. And this, this is true, I think, across geography, but it's, boy, is it ever true in rural areas. Ibram X. Kendi analyzed what has happened in this debate about centrism versus moving towards the left or moving towards progressive policies. And in an article he wrote called, When Will Moderates Learn Their Lesson? He said this, moderate Democrats also lost presidential elections in 1980, 2000, 2004, and 2016. Since McGovern, moderate Democrats have a losing record in presidential elections, six losses to the five wins by three people, Carter Clinton and Barack Obama. But this history, this history, this of losing more often than winning, is lost in discussions of electability. It is as if moderate nominees are undefeated. 
it is as if the last time a Democrat lost was when the party nominated McGovern in 1972. And I can say that for those of us who supported Bernie, and I know some folks on the call did and others did not, but whether, whether Bernie or Elizabeth Warren or others, frequently I heard people bring up the warning of McGovern as a progressive candidate who got his butt kicked. But a lot of centrist, moderate Democrats have gotten their butts kicked since McGovern. And in fact, Walter Mondale took an even bigger beating than McGovern um, in his election. If it's true that, if, if Lopez is right, that this persuadable group and a large number of them are in the countryside, are not looking for middle of the road policies, but they're looking for bold policies that address their issues, that respect who they are with all that that means. And it's also true that centrism is not a winning strategy, that it has not broadened the base. Uh, overall, or certainly not in rural communities, then this all of this is being compounded in rural places. This sense that the political process, and specifically the Democratic Party, uh, liberals and progressives, are ignoring and dismissing people. I quoted this last time, but in Sarah Smarsh's book, Heartland, she talks about this, and she talks about how when she went off to college and would be talking to her more liberal and certainly more urban colleagues at college, they were amused and amazed by the simple stories she told of her life growing up in rural Kansas. And she said they, they were so completely um, incredulous by the stories they told because they thought we didn't exist anymore. These folks from the city thought that people in the country living country lives, living agricultural or working class lives, didn't exist anymore, when in fact, we just existed in places they never went. So that's a very strong sense in rural communities that not just Democratic candidates, certainly Democratic candidates, but the academics, the elites, the liberals don't come uh, out to the countryside. Now, I'm not gonna read all of this, but this is kind of beginning to help make the shift to uh, the final session next week when we start to talk about what we can do. And when we talk about that, we're gonna talk about that in terms of language, in terms of thinking and framing, and in terms of actions. But one of the things we'll be talking about is Haney Lopez's idea of race class fusion. And this is an idea that he's tested with specific language in his book, Merge Left. There's a lot to this quote, but he says that when we merge the issues of racism and economic inequality, this approach reframes racism away from a conflict between war and groups, basically between white people and people of color, and presents it as a tool of division wielded to divide and distract all of us, wielded by the elites. He goes on to say that if you craft a message that's expressly race conscious, that stresses that racism is the principal weapon used against most of us, and emphasizes that whites too are victims of this, then you can also begin to show, uh, begin to build um, uh, an understanding that whites too can benefit from a multiracial coalition. A lot of what uh, Catherine Kramer found in rural Wisconsin, what Arlie Hochschild found in rural Louisiana, what I find in rural Appalachia is that too often white folks see it as a zero sum game. If I lose, if I don't win, somebody else wins, uh, somebody else's advance, somebody else's progress comes at my expense. And he's talking about reframing this so that uh, rural people, white folks in general, can begin to see that they would be better off as part of this multiracial coalition. He concludes by saying, that there is, that by doing this and by focusing on economics and merging class and race, it lifts up the possibility of nurturing a broad multiracial alliance that can push to get government back onto the side of working families. Right now we have a government that under democratic leadership is tepid about working class folks, is tepid about lifting up and making life better for poor people and working folks. Under Republicans, we have one that is actively opposed to the well-being of working folks and poor people. But the Democrats 
uh, have not helped themselves by being in this extremely tepid position. So I'll close with just again the link, which I think Stair has also put into the chat box to this rural urban divide. As I said last time, this guidebook, which has about two dozen different authors, including everybody I've mentioned tonight, many more, is a good way to begin to immerse yourself in uh, some of these perspectives and some of this analysis and some of the experimentation that's gone on to overcome the rural urban divide. Uh, it's it's a good, relatively quick grounding uh, without setting aside the time to read all the books that, that need to be read. So I'll just pause there. Again, the, the fundamental takeaway from this is if you have already people who have been uh, alienated from the economy by virtue of a combination of globalization um, and really poor policies that have, that have made an unlevel playing field between working people, rural people, and the wealthy, you have a, an anti-elitism and a sense of alienation that's been extremely well cultivated by the right. Um, and you have uh, people who feel that they've become strangers in their own land. And then you layer on top of that two political parties, one of which is doing no benefit to them but speaks a pretty good game, and the other of which, the Democrats, has tended to do to have policy that is lukewarm about their issues and problems and to speak in language that is confounding and alienating, it begins to make a lot more sense as to why so many people will have disavowed the Democratic Party. There's other factors to be sure, like the role of evangelical religion in, in small communities and rural areas and other things as well. Racism and bigotry is without question part of it. But I'm trying to lift up a different and significant part of uh, how we got here. So let's pause there and just open it up. Stare, you can facilitate the conversation or... Um, Thank you, Anthony. I think that it does work best if you stop sharing your screen at this point. Okay, I will um, do that. And then we feel a little bit more like a meeting. So yep. um, I was just gonna I was just gonna start up at the top of the chat and let you know what Juanita Joe said. So Juanita Joe says that she's been thinking about this last week. I've lived in my rural area almost 50 years, but suspect I'm considered an elite because I got a doctorate and taught at an elite institution. After 20 years of public school teaching in my county, what messages, strategies could I use to build trust among those who mistrust Dems? Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and if you want to uh, mute yourself and say a little bit more, Juanita, you are welcome to. I, I think that uh, that question pretty much uh, says everything. I, I ran for office last year and um, I thought that, that my background, uh, my history in the county, my history as a public school teacher would um, help to bridge the gap. And it, it doesn't seem to have done so based on the results. And I just, I wonder what kinds of things Anthony can think of, or maybe a, a, a source that he can point me towards where I can get some ideas about how to, um, how to build trust so that people, people believe that I, I really do have a history where I do know some things and I'm willing to, learn about other other things. Sure, Juanita, it's a vexing question and I'm 100% I'm with you. When I ran for Congress, I thought my 30 some years of working in communities, working with coal miners and farmers and loggers would give make me competitive in the race as well. And although specific individuals saw that and after election polls showed there was a little movement of independents and Republicans to me, basically I got my butt kicked. So it's the $64,000 question. Here's, here's what I think. Let me say maybe three quick things. One, I, I hate to keep uh, deferring this, but that question will be the focus of the final session next week. We will really get in fairly deeply about, as I put it, uh, changing how we think, changing how we talk, and changing what we do. Uh, but just to say in the meantime, the second thing is that I think you're spot on, it's a question of trust. And the mistrust of Democrats is extreme at this point. It's by no means every rural person, but it is amazingly widespread and it is incredibly intense and deep 
among a fairly good chunk of the population. So your individual efforts as a public school teacher, um, you would have thought would have helped to overcome that. But I think because this cultivation of mistrust, this sense that if you're a Democrat, you're an elitist, plain and simple, um, is something that is gonna just flat out take a long time to overcome. And taking the steps to overcome it is a matter of changing how we perceive people listening better, changing how we talk about it and changing our action. But I too thought that being engaged locally would kind of put me in a different category as a Dem. Uh, I think I see you nodding your head, Juanita, and I, you had some of that same sense. And again, I think it probably did for me and for you, but it was not enough to overcome the widespread mistrust. You gotta remember too, that when people go to the polls to vote, more so in federal elections, but at any level, most people don't really know you. You can do 100 town halls like I did, and you can do a big social media campaign. I'm sure you were out there. But the vast majority of the people, when they show up at the uh, polling place, don't really know who you are. So if the Democrat label means to them a, a liberal elitist who doesn't understand me and dismisses and disses me, that's what's going to carry the day. We have to change that, and it's going to take uh, many years to do so. OK, thank you. Uh, let me see what the next question is. We had one, sorry, I scrolled down and lost it. Um, okay, so if we work on a, if we work on a specific issue, getting money out of politics, how does one frame that message to appeal to rural citizens? 80% of Americans believe that this is a problem, but it's a matter of engaging with people on a personal level through an issue that they care about. So this is from my friend, Nancy Morgan. So Nancy, you can jump in here too, if you like. Yeah, thanks, Stair. Uh, the question is because 80% of Americans fervently believe in this, whether re Republican or Democrat, but engaging in them and, and making it an electable issue is difficult. And I realize it's framing the message, but how do you, how do you frame it to make them Passionate, about, passionate enough about, about the issue to vote, make it a voting choice. So I think, let me, a couple of thoughts. I, I don't really have a good answer for that, but let me offer a couple of things. First of all, I, I do think campaigns should, political campaigns, electoral campaigns, should certainly have substantive issues. But I think when we start focusing on issues um, we perhaps lose some of the broader question, which is how do we build trust? Because we may well have agreement on the question of getting money out of politics. We may well have agreement even on things like gerrymandering and redistricting and a number of other issues where there is widespread agreement, where polls say Republicans are uh, also in favor of. But that won't be enough to get somebody to vote for, for that Democratic candidate, or even to support a campaign if they feel that the campaign is being driven by elites. I hate to keep coming back to it, but it's true. They may agree with you on the substance, but if they don't trust you, they're either gonna not come out to support, or they might even actively work against something because they figure that something else is going on because the level of mistrust is so deep. So I, I, some issues are really tough to frame in rural communities. They really are. I don't think that is a particularly difficult one uh, to frame because you're right. The vast, vast majority of people in city and country alike think that politics is run by the super rich and the elites and that the average working person's vote hardly carries and that we, should do something about it. Now, the other issue you probably have to grapple with is, is the skepticism about whether anything can ever change. That's another thing that's pretty commonplace. So while you're framing the issue, you also gotta think about whether there are pieces of progress that, that you can show have been made uh, so people think it's not a hopeless situation. But, but my basic answer is, I think the problem is less in this case about framing the issue, because that's fairly clear, than it is about, um, winning trust of people so they'll join you in something they already agree with you on. Uh, 
Thank you, Anthony. Um, you know, I was really struck by this last slide that you showed about the race, class race fusion. And I thought that that was something that we should really be paying some attention to. So thank you for that. And I think that that will, you know, come out more and more. So there was a question about, um, Oh, given the perception of the Democratic Party as having been co-opted by Wall Street, do you think a VP choice of Elizabeth Warren would do anything to counter that? I do. I do indeed, yeah. Um, I don't, well, I'm not gonna get into my views on Joe Biden. I'll just say that if Joe Biden picked a candidate uh, like Warren, who, had, who is not progressive in every respect, but who has a, a practical history with the Commun um, Consumer Finance Protection Bureau that she advocated for and created that clearly helped uh, everyday people, uh, that really did take on the powerful corporations and credit card companies, and who has a, an analysis of Wall Street and the banks that is perhaps not quite as strong as Bernie's, but very, very strong, mm -hmm. I think, I think that that would help with uh, some people who are independents who've given up on both parties and who are probably not thinking much about voting at all. Now, would Elizabeth Warren help in rural communities? That's a much more complex question. Um, I'd like to think so. I don't know that that's the case. I think the image of her um, is, she, she's been painted as one of the elites uh, even though she's been fighting elites for a good number of years now. Good. Now, I'm not sure if I might have missed some questions in the chat. So everyone has the ability to raise their hand. I'm going to go ahead and put it in gallery view for me so I can s easily see whether or not you have your hand raised. Or if you don't have your hand raised, and you want to speak, you can go ahead and just unmute yourself. Um, it's just an add on to the Elizabeth Warren thing. She made a big point um, before Biden got the nomination. Would you identify yourself? I'm sorry, I'm Barbara Hazelett. Thank you, thank you. Just so I can find you. Uh, I'm right next to you on the <laughs> gallery. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, you're right between Nancy and John on mine. Oh, so. I'll see. <laughs> Uh, she made a big point of uh, going for small donations. I wonder if that would have any impact if, you know, if that could be a, you know, not being financed by the big guys. Yeah, I think that's, I, I think that's helpful for sure. I think anything that a candidate can do running at whatever level that strongly aligns them with working folks with everyday people and with the kind of everyday concerns that people have and and clearly distinguishes them from people who are willing and ready to compromise with big money in politics for sure as well as you know the people they have advising them whether they're from big bank elite backgrounds or or more diverse and, and, and more sort of everyday people backgrounds. I think all of those things are helpful. I, I think again, the, the fundamental hurdle that anybody with a Democrat um, or, or who's been categorized as a liberal has to overcome is the trust issue. And that's not something you do overnight. So, so I guess what I'm trying to say, not to sound like a dead horse, is that I do not believe that there is a suite of issues we can choose and the positions on those issues that by themselves will win over a significant number of disaffected rural voters who've either gone to Trump or given up on uh, the Democrats altogether and may not like Trump. I just don't think there's an amalgam of issues and positions that will do that. I think we have to be clear on what those are for people who are very issue oriented. I think it's the right thing to do. And I think eventually that will help but the biggest issue of all is trust. And so we'll be talking a lot in the final session about different ways that people are experimenting with trying to rebuild that trust. So why is the onus on uh, liberals, Democrats 
to do, to build that trust. Please Why identify I, yourself. Uh, I'm sorry. This is Deborah Joyce. Thank you. Why is it? Why is the onus on us? It's always on us. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good question. I think a lot of people feel it. And and anything I say about contempt and a lack of empathy and derision, you could absolutely build a case that the right does that towards us all the time. There's no doubt about that. Here's the reason to do it, Deborah. Here's the reason the onus is on us because what we've been doing has not been working. What we've been doing for the most part, has been playing into the narrative that the right has created, that Fox News and Breitbart and Hannity and Trump and that the right has created. We've played into it with what I consider to be tepid policies that have not really done nearly what we could have done to, uh, to level the playing field between the poor and working folks and elites. And we played into it with our language and we played into it with a general sort of cultural, a, a culture that has come to dominate the Democratic Party that is quite foreign to rural folks. So we have no obligation to try to understand and uh, reach out, be sympathetic, be empathetic, and try to dive down deep to understand why folks hate us. We have no obligation, except yeah. if we want to win elections and beyond winning elections, if we want to build a society that's going to work again. If we, if we want to have less division and we want to have more people who care about the common good, we're not going to do it by doing what we've been doing for the last 20 years. We're going to do it by changing our path. That's, yeah, that's the seems, reason to do it. It seems to me that we're damned if we do and we're damned if we don't. If, we, if Bernie was the nominee, the right would say, oh, he's, he's you know, a socialist. And then they would get all stirred up about that. So what? I don't see that there's any way. I just, I have tried talking to people that I used to be friends with who voted for Trump and I've tried to be empathetic and listen and, and, but I finally, I just gave up and I said goodbye to them and I don't have anything to do with them anymore because it just doesn't work. I mean, that's, that's a response that probably all of us have, had in at least some circumstances. And it's fair enough, it's exhausting. I, I will grant you that, uh, for sure. But I don't, first of all, let me be clear that we're not trying to win over everybody. We're not trying to win over proud boys and boogaloo people who are looking for the next civil war. We're hoping to just contain their violence. We're trying to win over a slice of people who have moved to the right, who have come to believe Democrats and liberals and progressives have hate them and do not have their interests. We're just trying to win over a slice of those folks, both to win elections, but also to be able to govern better and to be able to restore kind of the civic dimensions of our communities. We don't need to win everybody. And I, and I will tell you that in my experience, being on the ground doing work in, a very red rural area for the last 35 years, there's plenty of people who identify on the right who are also people who are sympathetic to a lot of what I say and what Bernie said. Bernie would have been vilified by Trump and the right-wing media machine, but not so much by average ordinary rural people, who a lot of whom really like Bernie. Let me get to a couple more questions here. Uh, Shelley, you have your hand up. Why don't you go ahead and unmute yourself there you go thank you Shelley I'm Shelley Tamras um, I was just wondering if you could uh, elaborate more on incrementalism but you're, you're muted yes you're muted Anthony <laughs> uh-oh <laughs> Can you unmute him, Stare? Let me just go see if I've got any. If you're the host, you yes. should be able to unmute him. Of course I can. Um, I have to look for him down the whole list. Here he is. Okay, so let me just No, you can just look the screen. So I, all look I at his do... picture, Stare. Okay, I did it. And then there's three can dots on the right-hand side. 
You can hear me now? Yes, thank you, Anthony. We can hear you. Sorry for that display of my technological incapacity. Um, Shelly, you're going to have to say the question again. <laughs> Sorry about that. Just wanted, just wanted you to elaborate on incrementalism. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So um, more people are calling it that now. It's gone by a number of different names. But basically, the idea is that uh, it's, it's a twofold idea. One is that radical ideas, bold ideas, like Bernie had, to some degree Elizabeth Warren, are just impractical. In fact, you hear Democratic pundits, you hear liberal uh, pundits who write for liberal publications oftentimes talk about that, whether they're talking about our healthcare policy, whether they're talking about climate change policy, whether they're talking about police reform. Um, you will, there's a general kind of caveat that we've got to go slow, we've got to go careful, uh, that anything that is too bold and too radical is simply not practical, political. On top of that, what the argument that Thomas Frank makes very persuasively, and to some degree Michael Lind, is that this has really become the comfort zone of this professional class that Frank writes about, or managerial class, as Lind calls it. That there's a, there's a fair number of people in the liberal establishment, whether they're directly in democratic politics or working for think tanks, whose job it is to tweak the system. They're experts in healthcare, they're experts in the economy, in the environment. And they see a system that is far from perfect, but they believe that the solutions must come slowly, must come uh, incrementally, uh, must be sort of a change that happens bit by bit rather than radically. And you see that not only in Obamacare, which was an enormously complex piece of legislation, you see that in Dodd-Frank. Other people have proposed that what we should have done with the big banks was, number one, broken them up. Secondly, prohibited them from ever regaining that level of market share. Third, disallow them from trading in speculative things such as derivatives, which Glass-Steagall did, and a few other bold steps. Instead, we came up with a 2,000 page plus piece of legislation that reigned in the big banks just a wee little bit that made some improvements around the edges that that made some some small changes but the big banks are as big as they ever were they're trading and speculative derivatives and other things just as much as they ever were um, they're putting the economy at risk as much as they ever were and that's after a multi-year process and an enormously big and complex piece of legislation so that incrementalism as with healthcare, got us a small improvement for an enormous amount of political capital and work. And I think it's partly because Democrats don't think boldly anymore, but I also think it's because there is a huge machinery of Democrats behind the scene whose job it is to tweak the system. And they don't, they don't want big change. David, why don't you go ahead, please? Took me a second to unmute. Hello, Anthony. David Rouse. Um, you haven't addressed the role of non-political, non-political party organization, uh, such as the Grange in the 19th century and other farmer alliances. The labor movement took off then. Uh, I would suggest that something you and Rick both suffered from was the demise of the UMWA. Uh, these aren't political parties, but they play a tremendous political role, and we've seen them decline. Point well taken, David. That's absolutely true. And it's a point that a um, sociologist named Theta Scott Call makes very, very well. Um, it's throughout Michael Lynn's book. So, you know, 50 years ago, the world was far from perfect. These civic associations and organizations were full of inconsistencies and discrimination, banning women from participating, African Americans from participating. There was plenty of problems with them. So don't, not to glorify it, but the fact of the matter is that everyday Americans had many different routes other than politics 
to shape the world that they lived in. Because these civic organizations, like the Grange in rural areas, like the VFWs, um, like even Rotary and other kinds of organizations, simply were bigger, were more participatory, and working people in these organizations were often side by side with the local banker, with the school teacher, with the elected official. There was a bit, again, in a context of racial and gender exclusion, but that big thing aside, there was a context in which everyday people were interacting, not just uh, socially, but actually making decisions about impact, things that impacted their community and their lives. Most of that is gone now. And most of that has been replaced, if at all, by interest group politics. And interest group politics is important at this point. It gets us, it, it keeps some really bad things from happening. Um, and it sometimes moves the needle a little bit on good things, but it's really different, much less, less participatory, much less satisfying in terms of meaningful participation than these non-political civic organizations were throughout that period, the kind of late 30, post-World War II, on up into the 60s and 70s. That loss has only ceded more ground to the rich and powerful, has only given more power to the elites, and has contributed to the sense that ordinary people have that nobody listens to them, uh, that they've got no say in the world that they live in. So David, that's a very good point. And uh, it's a point I make in my book, but it's not a point I made in this presentation, but you're spot on. Okay, thank you. Let me um, ask Maria to speak and lower your hand. There we go. Hi there, I'm Maria Borrell. Thank you for the, this has been a fascinating two, two series so far. But, uh, so you got my buttons pushed with uh, the trust word. Um, and I'm, I'm not even gonna go there because I don't understand how Democrats have a trust issue when we have the lying person that we have sitting in the White House. But I have just been wanting to ask you since last week, if you can please explain why, if they're against elitism and against big business and all the big interests and all that good stuff, how is Mitch McConnell reelected in Kentucky? I've been trying to figure that out and I just, it doesn't make any sense to me. So Maria, let me start by saying that I wake up every day baffled, perplexed and frustrated by this world and I go to bed that way. So <laughs> everything I've presented in these first few times and I'll present next week, all the work I've done, all the writing I've done, is in that context that I too am just like, I mean, I'm in a constant state of WTF. So I, I get that. <laughs> Let me just say a couple of things. So McConnell is quite different from Trump. Trump, who is an elitist in almost every sense imaginable, where he grew up, the fact that he came from a tremendously moneyed family, his most of his affectations and habits, et cetera, et cetera. He's an elitist to the core. But he managed to position himself to win over people by precisely by focusing on generating their hate and distrust uh, of people who are cultural elites. Trump is an economic elite and an economic elitist. But he, as some other right-wing politicians have done, managed to focus on cultural issues to get that sense that people are looking down on him. So when he holds his rallies and he says horrific things, he also says affirming things of the people around him. Matt Taibbi had a remarkable quote about exactly this. He, he said, I don't remember the piece, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he said Ronald Reagan was the first person to sort of say to the everyday Joe, you're okay being who you are. Trump has taken that several steps further, kind of affirming. Now that means affirming people as working folks, as farmers, as coal miners. It also means affirming people for their prejudices, for their, their anger, for their small-mindedness in some cases. But it's a package of affirmations that says, you're okay, it's these other people who are looking down on you. So Trump has just been a master of painting himself as an anti-elitist um, by focusing on these mostly cultural elites. Now, in terms of Mitch McConnell, 
He is not popular in rural Kentucky. He is not popular in Kentucky. People don't like Mitch McConnell. He does not harness the energy and the animosity that Trump does. McConnell has managed to stay in this position for so long because what he does represent to people in the countryside and to conservatives is a, a bulwark against a democratic takeover. That's really his sole, sorry about that, his sole reason uh, for survival, in my opinion. That and, and the fact that he's pretty good at delivering some of the bacon back home. Um, but his main thing is that people see him as he's keeping the Senate uh, from going to the liberals and going to the Democrats. And that, that, I would think, is why McConnell, who's quite vulnerable this time around, but why he's been able to survive so far, uh, because he really, uh, he, that, that, that's his main attribute as far as people in the countryside are concerned. Thanks. Thank you, Tina. Let's ask your question, please. Hi, Anthony. Um, I just kind of wanted to piggyback on what you said about the, um, the affirmations, because my father and I barely speak. Uh, unfriended him on Facebook. Um, you know, only speak once on holidays, that, that kind of thing. Um, but he had a, a triple, quadruple bypass uh, mm. uh, two years ago. And I went, came up to here to New York and, you know, to, to see him through rehab, right? And the minute I walk in, you know, he's got Fox News on. And, I, you know, I'm like, God, Dad, you know, can you just, you know, seriously. And this was before, you know, lying had started already. And, and what he said to me was, um, can't you understand that he has a message for people like me? And my dad, high school education, owns a trucking company, racist as the day is long, um, would never admit it, but he is. Um, you know, just, and when you, and what do you say? to somebody that says, that says that, that don't, don't you, can't you understand he has a message for me? I can't understand it. And it has crippled our relationship to the point where literally it's Christmas, Thanksgiving, Easter, and birthday. That's the only time we speak. That's it. Right. Yeah. So Tina, I mean, I'm sorry for the, the personal dimension of that. And I'm, I'm afraid it's all too common uh, yeah. within families and among friendships. So here's my thinking on it. What, what Trump has tapped into, and he's not the first one, but he's by far the best at it, is one other thing as well. It's the sense that people feel like who they are isn't good enough, that they're constantly being told that they don't eat right, they don't act right, they don't say the right things, um, their, their lifestyle choices are wrong, they're being told to, you know, all of this stuff. When I, when I read the thing from Ben Dreyfus, uh, from Mother Jones. That was an example of that, that, that if you're an environmentalist, you, besides embracing the environment, you shouldn't eat meat, which is murderous. You should be um, loving the glorious mir miracle of bloodless vegetables. You know, again, it's one little strand after another where people have come to believe, and again, they've come to believe it partly because it's real, but partly because it's just in the echo chamber of Fox and Breitbart and Trump and his tweets, for sure. But there's a kernel of truth there, which is the dominant society, which is more liberal, even though the politics isn't, people in my part of the world and in the country feel like they're always being told that they're not the right kind of person and they should get their act together. They should be woke. They should be conscious. They should be sympathetic. Their language should be more sensitive. Their eating habits should change. And there may be truth to those shoulds, but people get sick of it and they want somebody who accepts them as they are. And even though Trump couldn't give a hoot about coal miners or farmers or working people, doesn't know the first thing about it, he speaks in such a way that has convinced them that he does and that he accepts them as they are. Thank you. Uh, Susan Harford, please speak. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, I want to thank everybody for your questions, too. The, um, the presentation has been great and the questions have been great. Um, I have actually two. Um, 
let me ask the first, um, I'll ask them both at the same time. Um, the first one is Anthony. Up here, I'm in Northern Virginia, and you know, we saw even before all the Black Lives Matter um, unleashing, if you will, um, a lot of young people starting to get more involved and take some leadership roles, particularly um, in the environment, actually. Um, group, um, uh, but in some other areas also, actually in social justice areas. Um, but um, but now I feel like this tidal wave, thank the Lord, um, has been unleashed with the Black Lives Matter movement. A lot of it's the it's young people who are um, going out there and leading the way. Um, I have to believe that down in in rural Virginia, that young people may be breaking out, even if it's just small bits? Are you seeing any little leadership pockets among them or any generation gaps, as we used to say in my day? That's question number one. And question number two is, um, are, um, I saw that in North Carolina that a lot of the farmers um, have sort of moved into the environmental movement via kind of a cat from a cash flow a practical cash flow um realm because they're putting either wind turbines or solar panels in between their fields and because in north carolina the law there lets them um, share revenue um, they have a steady cash flow that they have found mitigates um, a lot of the seasonality and and unpredictableness of um uh, their livelihood, and I, we, we're not allowed to do that up here, and I was wondering if anybody's talking about that out in rural Virginia. So two questions. Great, that's great, Susan. And Stair, this is gonna have to be my last response because I have another engagement at 8.15. Um, but let me say that if there are unasked questions, please share my email with everybody and I'll do my best to get back to folks. So Anthony, I will do that. And remember we have the chat is saved and there are a couple of questions um, in the chat. Okay, great. So, so Susan, real quick on your, on your two questions. Um, yes, the, uh, there, there is leadership from young people in rural communities. It's spotty but the chair of the Scott County Democratic Party is a millennial, a young man. Uh, there is a group that's not as active now, but has been for several years called Young Appalachian Patriots, uh, which is mixed politically, but sort of with progressive values. Um, and so there has been uh, something of an uprising of young people, not as steady, not as conspicuous as in cities. I'll also say that, you know, during the protests, we had 500 people turn out for a rally in Withful just, just last week when all the marches and protests were going on, about 300 people in Abingdon. So, so, so there's, there's some of that definitely happening in rural communities. I think an important question is how do we cultivate more involvement in leadership among young people? Young people have different issues with the Democratic Party than sort of middle-aged and older rural people, but one of them is for sure that they see the Democratic Party as lukewarm, wishy-washy, centrist. And so if we, if we mm -hmm. form a, a bolder Democratic Party, we won't just win over some working people and rural folks, we'll win over young people. That's my belief. In terms of farmers, I think you're, you're right. And I, we don't have much wind potential per se in Southwest Virginia, but there is the beginning of farmers putting solar panels on barns and things like that. There's also this other thing that I'll talk about more next week, which is a way to reach farmers is by crafting legislation that will pay them for sequestering carbon in their soils, that will pay them for climate friendly practices. And that's beginning to catch on in some places. And I've been one of the people trying to help it catch on in Virginia. Um, but there are ways to approach farmers and other rural people that are livelihood oriented, that are incentivizing them and rewarding them for doing good things, whether it's around energy or sustainable production or carbon sequestration. And I think those are good to do on their own. And I think those will help with restoring trust and winning back some folks. Great, thank you. So with that, Stair, I'm gonna have to uh, leave the meeting. I'm sorry to, to have to leave, been a, I thought a great discussion. I'm grateful for it and really look forward to uh, having all of you back next week, I hope.
right. Yes, thank you so much, um, Anthony. And I'm going to keep the meeting open. Okay. So um, I'm going to stop the recording now, or just in a moment, I'm going to stop the recording. And then um, thank you all. We can have a continue having a discussion. Okay, so what I want to do first is I'm going to, I want to share the screen of our new Facebook cover that we're so excited about. I hope uh, you all can see this well. Can you? Bravo. Right? Yeah. Okay. So we're very excited about that. We want everyone to sign up for the Women's Summit experience, okay? It's 11 days of programming, 17 sessions, over 90 speakers, $25. It's, you know, if you can't do much of it, it's still a great way to um, work together and build community. So let's um, go ahead and um, let, I will now stop the recording. All right, let me see, oops, losing my controls again. Oh dear, let's see, <laughs> they hide. <laughs> Here we go. Um, first I'll stop the share, that'll be, help me out as well. And I will 